Hey everyone, welcome to another video here at Polygon Flow. My name is Galen, and today I'll be showing you a few of the ways that I use Dash to help build out my interpretation of the iconic hospital scene from the Walking Dead pilot episode. Dash saved me a ton of time in scattering assets, decals, and breathing life into this environment. In this video, we'll be looking at a number of scattering techniques, decals, cable placement, and more. The Decagon Hospital set is where I source the majority of the assets for this build, and the models they provide are some of the highest quality pieces on the marketplace. We've put a link in the description below to get the exact set if you want to see them for yourself. Alright, and with all that out of the way, let's get started. Let's start by looking at some of the blood spatter in the patient room. I sourced a few unique blood spatter decals from Bridge to help build out a gruesome scene in one of the rooms just doors away from where Rick wakes up in the hospital. There's a brief shot in that sequence where you can see some blood in the hallway, so I decided to build on that idea for this room. I knew I wanted a fair amount of blood in here and hand placement here would have been pretty tedious. So to start, I'll draw out a basic plane and match the basic footprint of this room. The reason that I did it this way is because I want the decals to be localized to just this section of the environment and not the entire ground plane. Next, let's type decal scatter into the bar. And I'll load this plane in as my surface input. There are a number of ways that you could do this using masking in Dash, but I elected simply to use this plane as a guide and hide it at runtime to get the desired effect. Now let's load in a few of the decals here and see how it looks. Out of the box, we're already getting a pretty nice effect. Since I've loaded in a handful of decals, the breakup is starting to look pretty natural as I increase the density. Affecting the min and max scale of the decals helps add even more variation. I didn't employ it in this use case, but if you wanted to add object masking to localize the projection area, Dash offers that here as well. This is obviously a pretty gruesome example, but I use the same method in the main hallway to scatter some simple garbage decals as well. All right, let's take a look at the ceiling next. I really liked how in the initial reference, there are lots of ceiling tiles missing above and broken up on the floor below. I started out by finding a material that I liked for the ceiling and modified it slightly to fit better inside of this world. I then used the modeling tools to help create a simple box, unwrapped that model to the texture, and added in a slight amount of noise using the displacement features. I made three different variations here, just to add a little bit of additional variation from tile to tile. Grid scatter allowed me to easily place the ceiling components and add in variation from piece to piece. As you can see, I needed to spend a little bit of time sorting out exactly what the scale values needed to be and how far I needed the pattern to actually extend, but in just a few seconds, we had our ceiling. And before all of that, I had roughed in some loose fitting structural metal components that I wanted to expose randomly throughout the hallway. Random remove was the perfect way to implement this, so I played with that slider and seating until I got the look that I was going for. The last thing that I wanted to do was add in a slight amount of rotation jitter, and a little bit goes a long way here. Now, one really important thing to keep in mind when using Dash is that the procedural tools can get you most, if not all the way there, a lot of the time. However, there may be cases where you want to edit specific elements with more control outside of the provided sliders once you get close to the look that you are going for. And I did exactly that with this scene in that I wanted to adjust a few tiles more directly and remove tiles where my cabling was going to sit. To accomplish this, you can bake the instances down and adjust each piece individually as needed. And one workflow tip that I would offer here is just to keep a version of the procedural actor just in case you need it down the road for future adjustments. Okay, let's take a look at how I employed physics in this scene. Let's stay with the tiles here for the next example. From the reference, I inferred that there are tiles that fell from the ceiling and crumbled under duress and time. As such, I wanted to take my existing tile meshes and crumble them up to match that type of duress. My friend Jacob Coidle has made an excellent video about the fracture system in the modeling tools, and so I employed a similar technique to break up the tiles and prep them for physics. 
and the link to that video is in the description below. After assigning simple convex collision to the individual pieces, I loaded up the physics tool. Essentially, I wanted to mimic the dropping of the tile pieces onto everything below. As such, it's important to verify that you have proper collision set up for everything that you are simulating, but also everything that your dynamic pieces are set to come in contact with. After selecting this grouping, all I needed to do was click dynamic and then start to see the end result. And we can do this for ceiling tiles, hospital clutter, and the like until we get a decent amount of debris. And I also used physics to create a few piles of pill bottles in the patient room. Duplicating my selection a few times resulted in a pretty neat effect. All right, let's talk about cables. Cables are present all over this environment and Dash helped me to accomplish this in no time. And there are several different types of cable implementations that I used here, so let's take a look at those. The first is drawing cables over a complicated static mesh. This toppled supply cart has a lot of intricacy that seemed like a really fun way to use the tool. And I wanted the end result to look like the cable had gotten tangled up in the object, so I started drawing. We need to start with the curve tool, and this will create the skeleton for our cable. It's important to pay attention to the minimum spacing setting when drawing, as you need to identify how many control points you really need in order to achieve the look that you are going for. If you have too many points, it will become really difficult to make edits. So err on the side of fewer, as you can always smooth the actual mesh out with the cable tool later. After we are happy with the initial curve, we now need to move towards creating a mesh around the spline. Quick pipe allows us to flag the curve that we drew as the main control arm for that piping. From there, we just need to dial in the radius, sides, and smoothness of the pipe. And I'll spend a little bit of time here massaging all the control points until I get a look that I'm really going for. And just like that, we have a nice complex cable setup on a uniquely placed asset without ever leaving the engine. I also use the cable tool to create a few one-off hanging cables from the ceiling structure. And I cheated a little bit in this example by placing assets up in the ceiling that I knew I wanted the wires to hang from. And this gives me a lot more granular control over where the wires are connected. And some really important settings that I leverage here are connection rate and cut rate to add variation in the bundles of wires. Min and max gravity adjustments were also super helpful in adding multiple elevations to the clusters. Add in some noise on top of that, and the cables really added a nice level of breakup to the scene. Okay, well I hope you found this video useful. I really enjoyed building this environment, and I hope you'll tune in to our next video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.